If you'll join with me again in prayer as we uh, prepare to hear from God's word today. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of your word, reading your word and hearing from you. We pray again uh, that you would prepare each heart, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your truth and for what it is you want to accomplish today. Father, whatever it is that you want to do in each of our lives, we pray that it would be done. Uh, we offer and open ourselves to you, to hear from you, to allow our lives to be changed. And thank you for your grace and mercy upon us. Where would we be, Lord, without you? And uh, we need you desperately in our lives. But we thank you for our time together today that you would have your way. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Acts. Pastor Eli has chosen to take us through the book of Acts. He has completed five chapters. And in the next two Sundays, I will take you through chapter 6 today and chapter 7 next week. The book of Acts provides a history of the church, the early church. The church that we see in the book of Acts was the first church. It is a model for us. It is a template for churches today. There is no other example of church models for us other than what's in the New Testament. The theme of the book of Acts is Acts 1-8. I'm going to ask you to turn to that because as we go through the entire book, everything comes from this one theme verse. This is the theme for the entire book. Acts 1-8. This is a powerful verse. Um, when I was in Sunday school, ninth grade and whatever, uh, high school years, they encouraged us to mark your Bible. Um, you know, before, when I was little, I got my first Bible. I didn't want anything to happen to it. I didn't want to drop it. I didn't want to, uh, you know, mark it up or anything. I just want to keep it really nice and clean. But it wasn't until I began to be discipled by those, by my Sunday school teacher, and he taught us to, to mark your Bible. So I'm going to encourage you to take out a pen today because we're going to cross-reference throughout the book of Acts as well as other verses. And it is God's Spirit who will be speaking to you. I'm a vessel that God will be using today, but it's not my words. It is not me who is speaking to you. It is the Spirit of God that is going to speak to you in a way that it's going to connect with you. That it's like, wow, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to say, wow, this is from the Lord. And if there's a, a verse or, or a scripture that we talk about as we go through, I want to encourage you to underline that, to circle it, to highlight it, mark your Bible up because, and even put a date that this is the day that the Lord spoke to me because... This whole uh, Christianity, our faith, is based on relationship, nothing else. It's based on your relationship with the living God. He speaks to you, He calls you, He empowers you, and He uses you to accomplish His will and purposes in this life. That's really what it's about. His Word is alive and active. It is His living Word that will communicate and speak to us. So, use the Word of God. I want to encourage you with that. Acts 1-8, but you will receive power. And in my Bible, I, I circled the word power. I underlined it. In fact, that whole section there, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Without this empowering, you can do nothing. John 15, 5, I am the vine. You are the branches, Jesus says. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Without the power 
without this power, this dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit that will come upon you, you cannot accomplish anything uh, for the kingdom. You will receive this power, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. What does it mean to be his witness? I'm going to ask you a question right now and I want you to respond. So this is an interactive thing. How many of you with full confidence can say that you have experienced God in your life? Raise your hand with full confidence and keep them high, raise them high. And I want you to look around this room. What you are testifying to is that you have tasted and seen the living God. You have now become a witness to a living God. That's powerful. Amen. Verse 1 8. You shall receive this power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you for this one purpose. You will be His witnesses. And this Bible, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. And these are Jesus' words. But He is speaking to us today. If Jesus was on the earth today, this is the same words He would be telling you. That you will receive power and you will become His witnesses. Let's continue. You're going to be His witnesses in Jerusalem. Well, where was Jesus speaking at the time He was giving this powerful exhortation to His disciples? It was in Jerusalem. And He's saying, you're going to be witnesses right here in Jerusalem. But it doesn't... Jesus didn't stop at Jerusalem. He says, and... In all of Judea, which is a whole nother geographic region outside of Jerusalem. And then even farther north, farther, another geographic location north in Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is a message to you and I that we need to be Jesus' witnesses until he returns. And we need to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, where is your Jerusalem? Your Jerusalem is right here in Milan. So if Jesus was speaking to you right in this geographic location, it would be, you will be his witnesses in Mililani, and maybe Hilo, and maybe New Mexico, and the ends of the world, the ends of the earth. But it is you who need to ask Jesus, where is your Jerusalem? Where is your Judea? Where is your Samaria? And where uh, is, does he want to take you to the end of the world? Each of us have the same message, but it's practically going to be applied uh, in different ways with different people. So your Judea might be different from mine, but it's whatever it is that God sends me to. Amen? All right. So, in that one verse, I've, you know, I just again, highlight, circle, I've, that whole passage is powerful. So as Pastor Eli continues when he returns, everything is going to hinge right on this. We're going to see uh, Peter ministering to Jews and Paul ministering to Gentiles and ending up in Rome at the end of the book of Acts. But everything is going to be based on being his witnesses and taking the gospel, the message, the good news uh, to all people. All right, so the book of Acts is our model. It is a template for churches. This is the history of the early church. And um, one of the things I wanted to see if we can get the lights, I wanted to show you three uh, video clips of just our own personal lives and things that we've experienced. Because one of the things that we wanna do is apply God's word to our life in a practical way. Every one of us needs to apply um, how do we apply God's word in my life? And so that is what we need to, to do. It's not just head knowledge, but it's, it's understanding truth and how does it apply to me and then going out and, and being obedient to that. Samaritan's Purse, uh, I did have a chance to share the last time we got back, but God put it on our heart to send us out. So this might be... Uh, not my Jerusalem, but maybe my Judea. <laughs> it's just an island north of us, right? So that might, this might be our, our Judea. We had the privilege of going to help with disaster relief. And uh, I wanted to show you one of the things that this ministry did. And 
and allowed us to do. Um, we went and met both physical needs as well as spiritual needs. We became the witnesses out in the boonies. Wainiha is kind of like the boonies. I mean, it's, it's, it's way out there. So um, God took us out there in places I would never have gone on my own. You can't see these places from the main road. And, uh, but there's people there that need the gospel. They need to hear the truth. And so um, let, let's go ahead and take a look. This is one of the things we met some physical needs. We're in this person's home. The roof is leaking inside the house while we are trying to um, set, you know, help rebuild this home. And uh, they had a skylight that they had to, I mean, it was just leaking and this lady had water at least up to here in her entire house. It was just flooded. And so by the time we came in, um, you know, we were able to repair the roof, but that's, so we went out and just blessed people, love on them, and uh, repaired their homes for free. Uh, next slide. I wanted to, uh, is there one in the middle? Oh. Okay, if not, that's okay. Let's go with the other video clip. So again, um, with Samaritan's Purse, we went out to meet needs physically, but we also met needs spiritually. We also wanted, went out there to share the gospel. This is Lisa ministering to uh, one of the families that we helped uh, clean up surface mold. And then um, the last time I showed you pictures of us carrying those huge uh, tree slabs. So let's uh, take a look at this. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I'm so grateful that bless you. Okay, so um, after we bless them by fixing their house, we, we present each of them with a Samaritan's First Bible, and uh, each of the workers uh, sign, um, write a little message, and bless them. We pray for them and, and uh, share the gospel. You know, let them know that there's a God who loves them and uh, ministers. All right, let's get the lights back on. So just wanted to share that with you. Let's open our Bibles to chapter 6 of the book of Acts and let's move through what's happening here. Chapter 6 is going to be, I'm going to break it into three sections. The first section is the church growth and church problems. The second section is men of faith full of the Holy Spirit. And the third section we'll look at today is opposition and suffering. Okay. Um, Starting in verse 1. Now in those days when the number of disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may have point over this business but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word all right so several things happening here right the church is beginning to grow and with any growth you're going to have uh, problems <coughs> and these problems are not bad problems because you know the church is growing and so you got growing pains and uh, so what we find here is there need to make, make some adjustments um, the apostles, okay, let me explain now. The apostles were the original 12. They were called apostles when they were walking with Jesus. They were called disciples, the 12 disciples. But when Jesus ascended and left the earth, then the 12 became the 12 apostles. Apostles are those that have seen and walked with Jesus they were taught by Jesus and they were sent out by Jesus. So that is in the truest sense of the word apostles, okay? Um, but they were the original 12 disciples and the word says that as the church began to grow, the number of disciples right there in verse one was beginning to multiply. 
So that's a good problem. The church is growing. And as they were multiplying, there were some complaints that some of the widows were being neglected. All right? So what is the tendency? The tendency is to have the apostles also meet the needs of the widows. Okay? But as they gathered together, they needed to establish their priority. The priority for the apostles was the ministry of the word and prayer. The word and prayer is the primary responsibility of the leaders and the elders and the pastors of any church. If the pastors and leaders neglect the word of God, what is going to happen? It's going to impact the spiritual health of the church. The church is going to become weak, anemic, spiritually um, deficient. The word of God and the ministry of prayer cannot be neglected in a healthy church okay and so but there's so much work to be done there is so much task to be done and the tendency like again is for those guys to be having those priorities and then running around and doing everything else but look at what they did so we're going to learn from this first church on how they solved this problem verse 2 the 12 summon the multitude of disciples and they said it's not desirable that we the apostles should leave the word of God and serve tables therefore brethren let us seek from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom which we may appoint over this business very interesting structure very interesting concept very interesting so the apostles in the wisdom, because the priority cannot be compromised, delegated the work. But they didn't delegate it to any, anybody in the multitude. It says there were multitudes of disciples, but they selected seven men. And they went after character, spiritual maturity, full of faith, good reputation. And what is the last one? The most important one. Full of what? The Holy Spirit. We looked at that in verse 8. That that is when you're going to receive the power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so select from among you seven men. Who have these qualifications. Who have these characteristics. Mature men. Full of faith. Full of the Holy Spirit. Good reputation. And they selected Stephen as one of the guys and the other six. And they said, you're going to select these seven guys, appoint them over the business because we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Do you see that right there? Very important. Once we compromise the word of God in this church and prayer, the only other result we're going to see is the spiritual health of this church is going to be affected. There will be compromise in the church. There will be sin allowed within the church. They, and, and it's just going to... It's almost like a... Um, um, one of those diseases where the body attacks itself. Autoimmune. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a science teacher. I'm supposed to know that, right? Okay. Autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself from the inside out. You, you get all kinds of problems. And then today, there's, there's many problems in, in churches today. But we don't have... We can be a strong church. We can be a mature church. We can be a healthy church. And again, it is the book of Acts, which is the model for us. Okay. All right, let's, um, let's move on to verse 7, 5 through 7. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And they chose Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they had laid hands on them. All right, so here's the seven guys that they selected, met those qualifications. 
and uh, they laid hands. So how, how, how come you see us laying hands in church? Well, it started in the first church, the early church, where they laid hands. And the laying on of hands here is not for them to receive the Holy Spirit or anything, but they laid hands on them to send them out. And uh, that's why we do that, because it's right here uh, in Scripture. You know, um, what, one of the things um, that we have to look for is uh, characteristics uh, that are in Scripture. And so some of us might be wondering, okay, where do we get the laying on of hands? And so it, it's, right, it's right there. Uh, there's things that many churches do. Uh, baptize infants, for example. Um, worship someone other than Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, um, you know, maybe Mary or something like that. But where is it in the Bible? Where is it in the New Testament? Where is it in the early church? You won't find it. It's not there. And so um, that's not the model of our the church that we need to build on. This is our template that we follow. Yeah, so it's all right there in Scripture. All right, verses 5 through 7. They chose Stephen and six guys. They were full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Oh, turn your Bibles. We're going to cross-reference today. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Some of you might be wondering, okay, those guys are full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. So what does that look like? How do you know these guys were full? How, how do you select guys that are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit? Well, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 refers to a passage that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. As we look at the fruit of the Spirit, I want us to examine our own lives. Okay, It's not a time for us to look around and look at others, but it's a time to self-examine and come before the Lord. Let the Lord speak to us. And um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are nine um, qualities of this one fruit. And it's the fruit itself is love. And uh, these are nine aspects of love. And uh, in fact, I went to my uncle's, uh, I went to my uncle's, 80th birthday on Friday night and um, my uncle attends uh, Olivet Baptist Church in town and uh, there's a lot of people that I knew because I grew up um, in that church and and one of the ladies uh, came up to me and she wanted to thank me because I went to visit her while she was hospitalized maybe a couple years ago so she just wanted to Thank me for coming and praying, you know, encouraging her. And then I, I turned to her and I said, you know, I want, I want to tell you something. It was your father, I told her, that was one of the first guys that discipled me in my faith. And I must have been only fourth grade. But my son, this is a, a son, so I was telling this lady that it was her dad and she was really touched. And, and you know the quality that I remember about this man? And, and, I, and I believe I told her this. It was his kindness. What I remember about this man was he was a very kind man. Um, gentle. Uh, he was an older man, but he was very kind and gentle. And I, and I told her that. And then as I'm looking at the fruit of the Spirit, it re, it, it's right there. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, but then um, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. See, that, that's, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness. And so I want to encourage you, because these are the kinds of fruits that we need to be displaying in our lives as we grow, as we mature. And um, the Bible says we're either going to walk after the Spirit or we're going to walk after the flesh. And uh, if we live by the Spirit, we will reap eternal life. But if by the deeds, if we don't put to death the deeds of the body, we're going to die. It's going to, we're going to die. And so these are the uh, 
the qualities there. So look at that and examine. And in your time with the Lord, you might want to pray. You know, Lord, I need to be more of a patient person. I, hey, that's all of us. I know. I, I, I hit everybody when I said that. Right? Lord, we need to be. I want to be a kind man. I want to be uh, a faithful man, a gentle man, uh, etc. And pray and see what God will do. Journal in your books. Uh, these are your prayers. You're, you're asking God to help you. The truth of the matter is it's only by the grace of God that we can grow and mature because we can't do it in our own strength. It's by the grace of God. And as we work alongside with what the Spirit is doing in your life, we, we, will, we will grow. All right. And so the Word of God started to spread um, as they were growing uh, in the church and as they selected these seven men full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, right there in verse 7, the Word of God spread and the numbers of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient of faith. Wow. You know, you talk about a church growth program. Well, here it is. <laughs> it's right there. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit and we need to be growing and the word of God spread. The gospel was getting out and the number of disciples uh, were increasing. All right. So what are some of the lessons that we can take from just this first passage? First of all, to grow the church, you need to, we need to be growing ourselves because you're the church, I'm the church. And how do we grow? We grow by the word of God, prayer, fellowship, and witnessing. I want us to examine ourselves this morning I had an opportunity yesterday to, in a sense, disciple somebody. This person was going through some frustrations. And he's a Christian, but um, the circumstances of life was just getting too much. And so I said, do you pray? The primary thing you need to do is you need to pray. You need to talk to God. You need to tell God. You need to, you know, and he says, oh, I pray about it. I, I pray all the time. I pray about all these things, all these struggles and trials and difficulties. I pray about that often. But yet, the life is still a um, burden, right? So I said, okay, what about the Word of God? Are you in the Word every day? He says, no. I said, well, you need to be in the Word every day. And the reason you need to be in the Word every day is because that's how God primarily speaks to you. He speaks to you through the living Word. If you pray and God speaks to us primarily through, the living, through His living Word, then we're going to tell God what we want. Okay, Many times that's how people pray, make a list. I want this, that, whatever, fix this, or whatever. But if we're not in the Word, how can God speak to you? If the primary way that God speaks is through His living Word and we're not in the Word daily, um, you're not going to grow. There is no way. You're not, you're not getting fed. You're not feeding yourself. You're not growing spiritually. And uh, so you need to be in the Word. Fellowship is important. In our church, Pastor Eli, as he started to launch... Uh, our church, he established Friday Night Ohana, which is once a month, and it was for the purpose of breaking bread together, prayer, staying in the Word, and fellowship. And all of those ingredients are there on Friday night, okay? So, um, that's one of the things that, and it's right there in the book of Acts, and that's one of the things that we started um, to do. But besides the Word, prayer, fellowship, we need to be witnessing. We need to share our faith. We need to talk to people about, about the Lord. When was the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When was the last time you told them the good news? All of you, almost all of you, rose your hand this morning when I asked if you have experienced God in your life. You are his witnesses. What are you going to do with that? 
you need to share what God has done in your life that will lead to the cross, the gospel message. Your story is your testimony. Nobody can refute that because you've experienced that. My mother-in-law, when she got saved, she was praying. Um, you know, my father-in-law was trying to pull this chainsaw and crank this, this thing and he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. Yeah. So many tries. Then my mother-in-law, she went over there and one time, wrong, she got the thing going. My father-in-law was so uh, flabbergasted, like, how did you do that? She shared, she shared, she testified her witness. She said, I prayed and I asked God to help me. And she did it. You see, that's her story. That wasn't my, I can't tell that story because that's not my story, but that was her story and only she can tell that story. Well, every one of you have a story because you already testified that God, you have experienced God in your life. Well, you need to tell somebody. And as you tell somebody, you become his witness. But don't stop there. Lead them to the cross so they get saved. That's the whole message in the book of Acts. Church growth. You've got to be in the... See, you're the church. And you need... We, you and I need to be in a word every day. Seven out of seven. You need to be in prayer 24-7. You need to be in fellowship not only on Sunday, but throughout the week. You need to make disciples by calling up somebody and say, Hey, let's get together for lunch. And when you meet with them for lunch, you listen. And you find out, how can I pray for you? And if God puts a word on your heart, share God's word. You're making a disciple. The Great Commission. There's two things in the Great Commission. Matthew says, go, in Matthew it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And in the book of Mark it says, go into all the world and what? What does it say? Make disciples. Good. See, you guys, you guys in the word. All right. Very good. Make disciples. So, we need to be connected. You need to be disciple and you need to be making disciples. You need a Paul in your life. You need a Timothy. Otherwise, you stagnate. You're a man all alone on an island and you wonder, after 20 years, I'm still in the same growth place. I, I haven't grown. I've, I'm just flatlined. Well, God has given you everything you need to do. But it's a matter of you disciplining yourself and, and doing it. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry is the job of the church leaders. And uh, one of the things Pastor Eli started to implement that I thought was pretty neat was at 9.10 on every Sunday morning. All the people that do ministry on a Sunday morning, whether you're a church worker, I mean, a, a church, whether you're a, a children's church worker, a nursery worker, whether you're a greeter, an usher, passing out bulletins, whether you're running the PowerPoint, whether you're doing a song, whether you're setting up Sunday morning, whether you're on a worship team, whether you're out there setting up the coffee, whatever you do as far as ministry on a Sunday morning, Pastor Eli is encouraging us to get started and meet under that tree at 9.10. At 9.10, all the workers on Sunday, we go over there and he, he, he equips us something from the Word of God and He prays over us and then He sends us out so we can do the work of the ministry. That is the job of a church leader, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, if you put the apostles in charge of the ministry of the Word, the ministry of prayer, and serve tables, what's going on? You're going to wear them out. And what's at stake is the spiritual health of the church. And then, you got to understand that the church is is targeted. So, you know, you you got a you got a wild animal in Africa. Well, the one that's going to get hit by the lion first is the weak one, and it's the sick one or the lame one, and we're targets of the enemy. And if we become weak, sick, or lame, we're going to be a. We, you you understand what I'm trying to get at? The Bible says the enemy is a roaring lion 
walking around looking to whom he may devour. So we need to be on guard. And the best way that we can be on guard is to be healthy. But you're the church. Uh, the building is not the church. You're the church and you need to be strong. You need to be fed. You need to be plugged in. You need to be disciplined uh, every day in the word and in prayer. And if you haven't called somebody up, pray. God, put in my heart. Who do you want me to call up to encourage this week? Okay? Uh, put in my heart. And as the Lord prompts you, um, immediately you should call right away. Okay? The more you contemplate, the more you're going to find you're not going to do it. So you need to be, you need to um, respond immediately to the promptings of the Lord. All right. Let's move on. Okay, verse 8. Okay, we're going to take it to the end of the chapter, verses 8 through 15. This section is what we're going to find is opposition and suffering. Opposition and suffering. Two things, two words that I don't like. I don't like that. What I like is I like everybody, love each other, everybody, um, you know, no problems, everything. It's just perfect. It's like, and, and my wife used to tell me, Clay, no such thing as utopia on this earth. <laughs> that's not real. And I got to remind myself because that's what I, but you know what, guys? One day it will be, right? When we go to glory. Amen. It's going to be wonderful, man. There ain't going to be no problems, you know? But let's see in the book of Acts, in the first church, in the early church, what did they experience as the church was beginning to grow? All right. Verse 8. And Stephen was full of faith, full of power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there rose some. Okay. Um, you see that word then? It's like a pivot point. See, all of a sudden, you got Stephen. They're... Describing Stephen, full of faith, full of power. And in verse 9, it's like, uh-oh, then something happened. Then, okay, so there's a pivot. Then what? Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of freedom, the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. All right? So you've got Stephen, one of the seven, full of faith, good reputation, full of power. And all of a sudden, there arose some in the synagogue... Okay, which is a place of worship and teaching. Okay. And they started to dispute with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Verse 11, then they secretly... All right, we're going to look at four things that's going to happen here. Then they, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And... All right, so the first thing they did was they arose. Secondly, they spoke secretly. Third, they stirred up, verse 12, the people, the elders, and the scribes, and they came upon him to seize him and brought him to the council. Verse 13, they also set up false witnesses who said this man doesn't cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us and all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel all right so look at what's happening here okay the opposition is, uh, is taking place. Um, what God is for, fill in the blank. Satan is against, right? The Bible talks about spiritual war and spiritual battles. Those are normal to church life. That's normal to your walk with the Lord, okay? Um, I remember when I was considering getting into the ministry 17 years ago. I was still working for the DOE. So I called up one of my pastors uh, at the time uh, when I was living on Maui. And I said, hey, Steve, what do you think if I get into the ministry? You know, what, what do you think if I, you know, because I, that was a big decision for me. I would have to 
I was teaching 18 years in the DOE up to this point. And it was a decision that if I'm going to go into ministry, I, I got to resign. I got to resign and then if I'm going into ministry, right? So, so I called, you know, and it's good to have mentors who's ahead of you that can advise you and counsel you. The Bible says in a multitude of counselors, what? There's safety. So we all need that in, in our lives. So Steve, this guy was one of them. So I called him. I said, Steve, what do you think? I, I'm being considered or I'm considering going into full-time ministry, but I'll have to, you know leave my, my job and uh, this is, was his response he says Clay you got to know that you know that you called and he, ex he told me and I'll, I'll tell you why he said number one the ministry is hard he says I can't tell you how many times I wanted to quit now this guy is uh, you know uh, he, he had so many I mean when I started my teaching career he was already in the ministry Okay, and that was 18 years already for me in a DOE, right? So he was 20, maybe 20-something uh, 20 years already in ministry. He says, Clay, I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I felt like I wanted to quit. But if you called, you called. He says, you're going to need to hang on to that anchor. Because if you don't know you called, and when the thing gets hard, well, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to waver, right? Or maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm not supposed, maybe I wasn't called. You got nothing. So you got to know that you know you call. So that was his first um, advice to me. And then he explained. He said, the re and he said it's hard because you're going to be targeted. You're going to have a target on your back. And he, and he just explained it like this. He said, if the enemy got the leader, he got the troops. So as leaders in the church, we all got targets on our back. And not to say you don't, but... I think the bullseye get bigger as you, you know. You, so you guys, so you need to pray for us because ministry is not easy, right? And so what we're finding here in the book of Acts is exactly that. You know, Stephen, one of the leaders. Stephen was not an apostle, but he was a disciple. And now he became a deacon. There's a Greek word for deacon, diakonos. And all that means is a servant of God. Deacons are servants of God, and there's many servants of God in this church, and many of you are deacons. So in this church, we got the pastors and the elders, and also deacons, okay? So, and, and that's what we find in this model of the early church. Stephen was a deacon. And as he was full of faith, in verse 8, and full of power, and did great wonders and signs amongst the people, the opposition came. Okay, so those guys arose, they disputed with them, they secretly induced, they stirred it up, and then they seized them. And they set up false witnesses in the council. Alright, so let, let, let's talk about that a little bit and let's think about that. Okay, there was a conspiracy to attack Stephen. He had a target on his back. Alright, they were disputing, the Bible says, you see that right there. Um... Verse 9, disputing. What is disputing? Okay, and, and I just want to help us to think and help us to understand, grapple with some of these things. Disputing is issues. And you'll hear it all the time in church. People have issues with this or people have issues with that. Now, issues can be fine because when the widows were being neglected, that was an issue. But how they handled it and did it they did them right. But when these issues are not handled properly, we can have all kinds of problems, right? So disputing is one of the first things that happen, and that's issues. So when there's issues in the church, we gotta be careful, okay? Because if we are seeking the Lord to try to resolve or whatever, then, then that's a good thing, okay? So there's always going to be challenges and problems because as the church grows you're going to get growing pains but those guys had the wisdom and uh anyway let's okay so disputes was the, one of the first one there the second thing that was happening is that they were persuading the men okay they were okay uh let's see 
Disputing with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, they secretly induced, okay, uh, men to say, all right, right there, they were persuading the men uh, at that point. And persuading, we have to be careful because what that is, is in encouraging people to take sides on an issue. Okay, we see that in the political realm all the time, right? But that shouldn't happen in the church where you're taking sides. Uh, another thing that we see right there in verse 12 is things began to get stirred up among the people, the elders and the scribes. And when you stir it up, it's causing a dissension and a division within the body of Christ. Okay, so you, you see what, what's happening here? All right, Stephen is targeted and you got this opposition come against them. And then now there is... Uh, issues and people taking sides and there's causing a dissension and division and even it says there were false witnesses that were set up to say certain things um, and false witnesses basically deceit and lies of, you know from the enemy when you look at these characteristics that is not a characteristic of the Spirit of God it is a characteristic from the enemy his, himself so we as a church need to recognize we need to recognize when problems come up and how to deal with them properly, okay? Now, I want to share, well, okay, so this is, this is what I want to do is I want to, I want to share with you how do we deal with some of these problems um, that arises in the church, right? Um, and so I went to a pastor's conference up at, uh, uh, in California a few years ago and I signed I took I attended one of the workshops that I thought was really um, really good it was really practical and I came away with this this and this is what the guy was was um, sharing so let me share this with you because I've never um, it it just made a lot of sense to me okay so he said he said you got this person here let's call him person a and he has a problem with person C right Person C uh, either offended A or hurt A or something like that. But pro person A has a problem with person C, okay? Because he was hurt or offended or something. But what does person A typically do? Person A goes to person B and tells them and talks to B about C, right? So person A goes and talks to person B about C. He says, what you need to do at that time, if you're person B, is you go to person A and say, did you talk to person C about this? And if the guy says no, he says, I don't want to hear anymore. Exactly. You need to go and talk to C. Matthew 18 says, if someone sins against you, you go and tell him his fault, just you and him alone. There's only two of you. You don't go talking to people about somebody else. That is going to cause a division and dissension in the church. Those characteristics we just read, that's what's happening. The dispute, you know, they're stirring it up and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Now, person A has a problem with person C, but he goes and tells B. B says, did you go and talk to person C about it? And person A says, yeah, I tried and I already did. Then person B says, okay, I'll go with you and let's go talk to person C, okay? The Bible says in Romans 12, to be at peace with all men, what? As much as it depends on you. So you have to do everything you can and you have to exhaust every avenue to be at peace with one another. Now, the truth of the matter is, this side of eternity, it's not possible all the time to be at peace with everybody. But don't let the onus fall on you. Let it fall on the other person because every one of us got to an answer to God. We got to check in, right? And if you've done everything you can to be at peace with all men, what else can you do, right? So I'm just saying we got to be wise because there is an enemy. Okay, I want you to turn to the person to your left. Okay, right now, everybody ready? Turn to your person to your left. Well, no, you can't do that. Turn. Uh, no, okay. 
No, you can't. Let's, let's try that. Okay, you don't have to see their face, but everybody turn to the person to your left and you know who they are. Okay, turn to the person to your right. Okay, you know who they are. You, you, okay, now look behind you and look at the person behind you. Okay. <laughs> the truth of the matter, and what is the truth? The truth of the matter is these people that you saw and you looked at are not your enemies. They're not your enemies. There's only one real enemy that wants to stir the whole thing up. His objective is to, is everything God is for, he is against. If God wants to grow this church and mature this church and have this church spread the gospel into your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, guess what? He's going to do everything to prevent that from happening. And one of the ways is to stir it up so that you get deceived thinking the guy next to you is your enemy. The spouse you live with is your enemy. The person you're doing ministry with is your enemy because I got offended. And we're not mature enough to deal with what Scripture says. The Scripture says, overlook offenses. But if you cannot, then you go and talk to the person. Don't go talking to other people. Because then you're going to stir it up. And then the enemy is going to make sides. And then, then you, you know what's happening at that point? Then you become a person who is cooperating, not with God, because that's not of the Lord, right? We looked at that, all those characteristics, that's not of the Spirit of God. Disputing and persuading and stirring up and false witness, deceit and lies and all that kind of stuff. That's not from the Lord. So, but if you're participating in it, then guess who you're serving? So you gotta be wise and mature. Now, another thing as disciple makers is you gotta be able to confront in love your brother or sister and rebuke sometimes because you love them enough to tell them the truth and saying hey sister my spirit was grieved because i heard you uh gossiping about somebody else and my spirit was grieved and and that's not pleasing to the lord you got to be able to help them see that because a lot of times we blind them right we got to help each other you, you guys with me all right okay Let's talk about suffering. Like I said, these are subjects. <laughs> I'm waiting until glory. I don't even, you know, <laughs> I tell you. But it's okay. In the book of Acts chapter 4, Peter and John was put in prison. In Acts chapter 5, verse 40, they were put on trial. Okay, open your Bibles. Acts chapter 5, let's go to verse 40. All right, the apostles are saying in verse 40, they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beat them up, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. And what does it say after? So you got this picture. The apostles are spreading the gospel, obeying God, because they're witnesses, they're serving God. <clears throat> But as we, but one of the things that we find is suffering is a very normal, natural part of the Christian life. You got to understand that. If you think that I want to go through the Christian life without any suffering, um, you got to pick another. You, you got to, you got to pick another religion or something. Because Christianity, Jesus is is our example. He went to the cross. Um, so the apostles were beaten up. And they were told that they got to not speak anymore in the name of Jesus, about Jesus, about his resurrection. And then they departed. And how did they respond? Okay, get out your pens. Mark this down. Sir. They responded when they were beaten and su started suffering by rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow, what an example. What an attitude. That's how we need to look at the Christian life. If you suffer for the name of Christ, consider it that a, a blessing that you count it worthy to be able to suffer along with Christ. Right? Wow. They were rejoicing that, man, I'm privileged. I get to suffer for the name of Christ and could suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease, they did not stop teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. 
until your very last breath and my very last breath, we got to be a witness. We got to share Christ. We got to talk about Christ. We got to tell people about Christ. And these guys were put in prison. They were beaten. They were brought before the councils. They were being stirred up and, and all targeted and all that. But they counted it a privilege. Awesome. That was a, that's, and the Bible says, while all this is going on, the ch people are being saved. Can you imagine that? The gospel's getting out and people getting saved and the church is growing in the midst of this persecution and suffering. The goal for us is not to avoid the suffering, but to be empowered by the Lord so that we can fulfill His calling upon our life. That is um, the amazing thing. In chapter 6, um, oh, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 18 says, Suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18, another powerful verse. Suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. You got to remember that this life is temporal. You got at max on the, you know, maybe 100 years. That's it. What does that compare with eternity? Um, the suffering of this present time not even com worth comparing to all of eternity, the glory that is to come. 2 Corinthians 4.17, another key verse. For a light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We've got to have that eternal perspective. Okay, turn over to Acts 5.29. Get out your pens one more time. Another key verse, powerful verse. 5.29. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, in spite of all this suffering and threats, being thrown in prison, being put on trial, being beaten, we ought to obey God rather than men. What is your theme of your life? What is your verse? What is your slogan? Are you going to obey men and not please God? Or are you going to please God and not please men? Pleasing God is going to come with suffering. But when it's all said and done, I would rather please God and be in eternity than please men and lose that eternity. Who is our Lord? Who is our God? What are we living for? We must obey God rather than men. Amen. Now for our conclusion today, number one, you've got to do the basics and the fundamentals. Every one of us, every one of you. And if I'm not an example to that, then, then I don't belong here. I need to be that example. Pastor Eli needs to be that example. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in prayer, fellowship. We need to be sharing our faith. But you need to be doing that because you need to grow and be effective. So you can fulfill your calling that God has placed on your life before this life ends. Number two. You need to be full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. You need to be filled and be being filled. You need to ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit, the book of Ephesians says. For without me, you can do nothing. And there's times and we try to do things, or I try doing things on my own, and <laughs> what a mess, right? We need to be full of the Holy Spirit to do the work of God, fulfill the things He has called us to. Number three. You need to share your faith. You need to be a witness and take the gospel to your Jerusalem all the way to the end of the world, wherever that might be. You need to be faithful in sharing your faith. Number four, you need not, do not be afraid to suffer, knowing that it is a privilege to be counted worthy. And finally, number five, God can do amazing things through ordinary people who are empowered by Him. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, there you have it. All right, I'm going to have you to stand. I'm going to pray over you guys, and, I'm gonna, and we're going to be sent out into this world. Okay?
the mission field is once you leave these doors and in the shepherd to the sheep what did I exhort you to do I exhorted every one of you to share your faith with somebody today I want I want you to hear that I I'm exhorting every one of you to share your faith with somebody today right now it's about 11 o'clock and you're gonna to go to bed in about 12 hours you got 12 hours to pray to ask the Lord to lead you to put somebody on your heart to pick up the phone and call somebody a relative a friend a neighbor a co-worker who is headed to hell who doesn't know the good news and let me and 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 it's as simple as well it's as simple as uh, it's as simple as this. I went to McDonald's the other last week. My cousins were here uh, because uh, my daughter's wedding, etc. So this cousin was from San Francisco, and she wanted to buy me an apple pie, uh, no, a halpia pie from McDonald's. So they were all eating pies. So I said, "Give me your." Uh, so I took the covering of the pie, and I, I, I made a gap, and I said, "Hey, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you a story. God loves you, but we got separated." And then I took the third one and I bridged the gap and I said, hey, Jesus died for you so you can get to God and be saved. Anyway, many ways to share the gospel. That's simple. You know, you just look. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm going to pray for you guys. Let's all stand and we'll close. Jesus, we call again upon your name and thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for empowering us today. I pray over this church. These are your people. God, you have uh, saved these people. And they have become your witnesses. And right now I'm going to just send them out, Lord, to be empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit so that they can be your witnesses right here in Milani. And uh, put on their hearts because everyone has an assignment today to seek you and see who they're going to share the gospel with in whatever way, Lord. But use them for your glory. We want to be obedient to you. We want to be a strong church, a healthy church, and a mature church, Lord. So... I thank you for what you have done today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Okay. Go. <laughs> All right. God bless you. We'll see you.